You have it. Nice to see you there. Ma! Ma! Come look at someone's watching a video. Tell you the words. I real people. Internet people. So today I'm out in location, in a particularly scenic part of sunny Gateshead. Now this place, Lobby Hill Road, it's a part of the region that's probably not too familiar to many people. It doesn't appear in many tourist guides. I mean if you live around the bench area then you'll know it of course, and if you're from up Derwent sideway you might vaguely recognise it somewhere the bus to Newcastle speeds through. Or you know, since the Asker Road changes it's a place that a fair few drivers will become very familiar with. Maybe that's just me? Uh, yeah, anyway. Today I'm going to be tagging a bit about transport. And the reason I'm starting from this seemingly random street in one of Gateshead's least sexy crannies is that thing, that bridge guns over the street there. Most people won't have given it a moment's thought, but believe it or not, that wee little bridge there, it just might be the solution to the region's transport problems. To indulge in a spot of hyperbole for just a moment, that innocuous little bridge over there, it's the key to the future prosperity of the region. Traffic. We all know it. We all love it. But, let's be another under a rock lately, you doubtless know the cars are getting a fair bit of sick these days. Controversial I know, but global warming is saying it's a canny big problem for life as we know it, and in the UK transport's our biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, with cars alone making up 18%. Before I get too into that though, this isn't a video about climate change. We've all heard plenty to know that's a problem. I'm getting on in years now, I remember being taught about it way back when I was in school. And as we all know, it's getting ever more attention these days from all sides of the political spectrum. These days, it's basically just nuts from beyond the pale who refuse to admit that the end of the world's, you know, a bit of an issue. We all agree that fossil fuels need to be cut back, that we have to stop burning koalas and people on Holland shouldn't be forced to get swimming lessons. A lot of people are quite rationally saying though, we well, yeah, aye, that's bad and all, but so what? I need me car. Works 10 mile away and it'll cost us 10 quid and take us 2 hours to get there every day by bus. We all care about the planet, but we also want to live our lives, we need to put food on the table. Most people aren't going to massively reduce their quality of life just so they can have a tiny impact on helping to slow climate change. I mean the UK only accounts for what, 1% of global emissions and there's a good 32 million cars on the road. What difference is one person really going to make? Lest we forget though that global warming isn't the only problem with pollution. Car exhaust is a well known method often you sell, but if you're in exhaust rooms your entire life it just isn't great for your health. In parts of Tyneside air quality gets so bad that it absolutely crushes legal limits. Recent articles have even gone so far to suggest we're the worst in Europe which Aye, absolute worse than Europe, you never beat the Naples then. Nonetheless, you can't argue that air quality around the centre town doesn't get pretty bad on occasion. The clean air zone stuff you'll have heard about, it didn't come completely out of nowhere. So what am I saying here then? What are we going to do about all this auto pollution? We need to be sensible here. Shouting, just stop driving, yeah, that's not going to cut it, we all need to get to where we're going. Whether or not you think it's desirable, the lovely dovey hippie dream for world without cars, yeah, it just ain't realistic if it's daft to pretend it is. If we're going to cut back on the amount of traffic then arguments about pollution just aren't going to be enough on their own. There needs to actually be something in it for the people who are currently driving to make it worth their while to drive less. At the very least you need to fix the current situation where for so many people not having a car is just automatically a much more difficult way to live. The fact is, sad as it is to say, that for most people in Britain today you absolutely need to have a car in order to live a normal life. For myself for instance I'd love to live completely car free but when we have half's job and the bands and all that it just ain't an option for her. Going off on a bit of a tangent here and this is something I'll talk about in more detail another day, but it's worth remembering here that around a quarter of households in the country didn't have a car, and for many of these people that isn't by choice. For example only 60% of disabled people have a driving license, as compared to 78% of non-disabled people. Data overwhelmingly shows a heavy link between poverty and not having a car. It's a nasty catch-22 type situation where you just cannot afford a car because you didn't have a job because you need a car to get to work, you know it's awful. Driving's just fundamentally something that most working age people are forced to do. And there lies a really obvious problem that for most people probably would have come to mind at me very mentioned in the word traffic. Sitting in it sucks. Some people like driving, I the day. Honestly, I can really see the appeal of speeding along on a nice open country road on a lovely summer's day, near other cars in sight, you know, just like in the adverts. But I seriously refuse to believe that anyone would choose to spend the day sitting in a traffic jam. It's bloody awful when a two mile drive takes you an hour. We've all had to get out of town at rush hour, yeah? Absolute nightmare. Worth remembering and all that whilst all these thousands of people are stuck in the car for two hours a day trying to get in and out of town, as well as being canny annoyed, it's a group that also creating a big economic drain. 
all those man hours are being wasted on what's basically unproductive work rather than me charging at home or going out and spending the pay. Things which, needless to say, also have a big mental health implication. There's been a fair bit of research put into actually trying to quantify this stuff and to hope it'll actually prompt governments into doing something to solve it. So you can see from both the qualitative and the quantitative side of things that it's an actual fact. The traffic sucks. I could gan on all day. There's plenty more valid data points against heavy traffic. The stuff about how being stuck in the back of a car can hurt a child's mental development, that's particularly fascinating. It's all very interesting and well worth looking up. If you want to hear more about the big picture arguments against an overly car-centric real life, then I'd recommend the YouTube channel Not Just Bikes is doing a very good job of it. But the point of this video isn't to bang on all day about why traffic is bad and wow, that cut a lot of content where I did just that. If you didn't believe that traffic's bad, then uh, please just bear with us as we play pretend and move on. Newcastle has a traffic problem and that problem needs a solution. So, as I mentioned before, air quality levels around Tyneside tend to be, you know, less than brilliant. There's a few roads around the centre of Newcastle and Gateshead that are key to this as the worst performing places in the region for air quality. And, aye, Kel's surprise, no? It's completely typical for the centres of towns to attract the most visitors, whether it be for work or leisure, and in large cities without decent transport systems, these people do tend to come by car. In the Newcastle area though, our problems with city centre traffic are far worse than most. The major reason for this is that in Tyneside, basically all north to south traffic is channelled through just a few, rather literal, choke points. Everyone has to gun down the same few roads, even if you source your destination and nowhere near them. We are of course talking about the famous bridges of Newcastle and Gateshead. Rivers, you say, rivers are tricky things. Due to walking and water being beyond the can of many, rivers have traditionally made for excellent places to draw borders, such as in the Tynes case that between ye olde counties of Northumberland and County Dale. But in later times, the Tyne came to act as a highway and a source of easy water for industry. This led to intense development along both its banks, given with the Tyneside run out today. Unlike, say, the Irwell in Manchester or the Ouse in York, the Tyne's a beast of a river. With its steep banks and the old demands of shipping up and down, bridges out of the Tyne have always been very expensive and complicated projects. This adds up to mean that we have a very limited selection of bridges, but overwhelmingly are clustered around just this one area of the city centre. In the 10 mile between the city centre and the coast, you have a very densely built up area of around half a million people, and just one place to cross, the Tyne Tunnels, which, let's not forget, are toll roads and we are northerners. This means that for most journeys you need to go through the city centre, even if you've no intent on actually visiting it. Say for instance, going between Heaton and Low Fell. The most sensible route takes you right out of the Tyne Bridge. The sheer number of vehicles trying to cram through this very small area, particularly at rush hour, it cannot not be a problem. So is the answer to build more roads then? In Newcastle's case, maybe a bridge down Walker? Ah, way, that's another topic for a future video in itself. A Walker Bridge, it actually is something that's been considered a bunch of times in the past. But to build a public car bridge down Friars Goose these days, it would lead to huge amounts of traffic trundling up through residential streets in Walker, only then to be dumped in that annoying roundabout at the top of Biker High Street. From there, they'd either have to join the long line of traffic gang down to try and get out of the Biker Bridge, or head up on Chillingham Road towards the coast road, and ah nah, it'd be chaos. It'd be dumping traffic in areas where efforts are actively underway to try and reduce it. It really appears here to think beyond the supposed common sense surface level, and to look towards a well understood transport planning concept known as induced demand. The idea of induced demand is that basically if you build new roads to relieve congestion, then this inevitably will only be a temporary measure. The amount of traffic will build up to exploit the new routes until they too become congested. Induced demand is actually the key reason why Newcastle dropped its major motorway building project back in the early 70s. Again, that's a topic for another day. I admit, this is kind of counterintuitive, it goes against common sense. But more often than not, building more roads does make traffic worse, not better. So nah, there definitely are arguments for building new roads and bridges in various places, but this won't do much for our traffic problems. It's clear that trying to fix traffic problems with more traffic is a fool's errand. So let's strip things back here and think about the basic problem. It's not that there's too much traffic. The core problem, the job to be done if you will, the reason why most people are out driving, is that they're at point A and they want to get to point B. Though commuting isn't the absolute number one reason for most journeys, it is the most critical one, due to its tendency to bring huge amounts of cars to the same few locations at the same time of day, it's the major cause of most of the world's traffic problems. According to the 2019 Labour Force survey, in the Newcastle travel to work area, 72% of people drive to work with over 12% travelling by bus. I know, I know, 2019, a lot's happened since then. That would have reduced the numbers a fair bit given the amount of people working from home these days. But as anyone who's been out in bush hour lately will tell you, things very much seem to be back to normal by 2023. So, where exactly are these people coming from? Where are they gone? How many of them are clogging up traffic over the rivers? First, let's look at where the people are. So here's a population density map of south of the river. For people living in most of these towns, driving to work's just the only choice they've got. I used to live in Stanley and taking the bus to Newcastle and back every day, it's bloody exhausting let me tell you. You really need a car if you're going to live there. 
and Stanley's one of the better linked places. Second, where they all gotten? Where's the jobs? Switching over to Google Earth here, I've highlighted the major employment areas around Newcastle. Again, elephant in the room, due to the fallout from Corona, things are in a big period of change right now. Trends that were already existing have been sped up by a decade or two, whilst industry remains on trading estates, office jobs are increasingly moving away from scattered business parks or gigantic car parks and towards home offices and city centres. All data suggests the 20th century trend for out-of-town offices is really odds last legs. Newcastle City Centre then, even now, it's the top employment area, with many times more workers than any of the other highlighted areas. It's the region's main employment centre for people from all walks of life. The next biggest centre for employment lies southwest over the river, the Team Valley Industrial Estate. Here you do find a surprisingly large number of office jobs, but overwhelmingly it's the major industrial centre of the area. Other areas you might notice are the Newcastle Business Park, just west of the city centre, the very much in decline Metro Centre in the surrounding area, Gateshead Town Centre in Salt Meadows, and then we at the southeast of Nissan site and its environs. Also included here is the Ministry up in Long Benton, though it won't be existing for much longer. Its 9,000 employees are being added onto the clump in the city centre. This is something that has quite a lot of people in a panic, assuming they're all going to be driving and looking for parking spaces. I won't show you my attempts at actually mapping the commuter flows here, it's way too messy. Let's just use our imagination. So we've got all the people scattered here, and we need to get them to here. We know for a fact that there aren't enough roads for everyone, and that building more roads is neither practical nor desirable. So let's look back to the start of the video here. Just what does that random ridge our road and gates head far from the city centre's traffic have to do with anything? Just what is this branching curve thing anyway? Just what am I suggesting as the solution? Ha 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 ha. Well I'm glad that I imagined that you've asked those questions. The answer is a thing that's very dear to me. And that thing is... Drives! 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 I like drives! Trains. I like trains. Be rest assured, however, that I realised trains are the logical answer to this traffic conundrum long before I made the brilliant decision that this rather dry video about public transport needed a death metal musical interlude. But why trains are here, you ask? What's wrong with buses? And to that I say, wait, nout? Buses may lack the flash and raw sex appeal of trains, but seriously, buses are, well, can be, great. Buses are something I want to be covering in depth in future videos. Improving the awful bus service in areas is another big part of how we can lend the North East with the power of transit. But in this particular case, we're trying to cut down the amount of traffic coming out of the town, a valuable opportunity presented to sell with railways that we just kind of pass up. To see why, let's take a quick look at the railway lines in the area. Back to the maps we go, hey! So, you can already see highlighted in the glorious magnetic spooge here is Newcastle Central Station. Let's take this as point zero for our railways. So first we've got the metro. The yellow and green lines both pass through Central Station Metro Station, uh, north to south as you can see. Metro is, well it's the metro, I could talk about the metro for hours. Do keep an eye out to my future videos if this tickles your fancy. But TLDR, this central bit is, absolutely no debate allowed, mint. The trains come every 3 to 10 minutes or so between Paylor and South Gosforth. Moving on to the main line, over here we've got the German Coast Line. Between Paylor and Sunderland it shares track of the metro and isn't a separate line in its own right. As you can guess from the name, this is the line that goes down the coast of Historic County Durham, from Newcastle right down to Teesside. It's a line with a fair few problems and its existence is often forgotten. Nonetheless, it is quite important with a large amount of people using it, especially to commute to Newcastle every day. Hartlepool Station, for instance, is used by around 0.6 million passengers in the normal year. Next then, over here, you have the Tyne Valley Line between Newcastle and Carlisle. This line runs through the western end of the borough of Gateshead and out into the sticks to Hexham and beyond. In complete contrast to the Metro and Gateshead East End, Public transport in the West End of Gateshead is pretty rubbish. Dunstan Station, for instance, gets less than 20,000 passengers per year. That's less than a quarter of even the least used metro stations. If you look at the amount of people living in the area, then this really doesn't add up. It's a textbook case of how a regular low frequency service can really ruin public transport. Cannibalisation factors in an hour course. Why should you study a train timetable to see when the hourly ish, mostly, sometimes, trains come in, when you have a regular bus into town every half hour? Last, but definitely not least in our tour of the region's railways, you've got the East Coast Main Line. Odds are good if you've ever gotten a train from Newcastle and it wasn't a metro, then it was on this line. It's what all the trains up to Edinburgh and down to London and Manchester via Dome and York and pretty much everywhere else were on. The East Coast Main Line is basically the region's life support cord, absolutely vital for connecting with the rest of the country. 
Aside from the single north to south connection and the slow link out west to Carlisle, we're basically an island up here in terms of railways. Switching maps for a moment to look at population density, one thing that's always struck me as rather odd about the East Coast Main Line is that there are no stations between Newcastle and Chessie Street. On a national level, this 50 mile stretch, it might not look like much, but at this level of zoom you can clearly see it runs right by Central Gateshead, where the population density easily ranks in the top 10% in the country. You've also got Team Valley with no station right next to the line, with its 25,000 jobs accessible pretty much only by car. It wasn't always this way, historically there were a number of stations in the area, most of these were closed pre-beaching back in the 50s. Here they are marked on the map to give you an idea of quite how useful some of them would be. So, easy solution you might say, just reopen some of these old stations right? We've already got the railway line there, so it's just a case of spending a few million apiece to rebuild the stations. Job done eh? Alas, I'm afraid it's not so easy. This is the main line connecting London and Edinburgh we're talking about. There's huge demand from express services. This and the West Coast Main Line through Carlisle are only two options for getting between England and Scotland by train. Despite the East Coast Main Line being such a vitally important piece of infrastructure, you'll notice it only has two tracks, one heading north and one heading south. If you're going to mix local traffic like the Metro with express trains, then you really need separate tracks to keep the slow, all-stopper trains separate from the giant 125 mph beasties. Different day that and the bound to dunch, splattering blood, guts and train parts far and wide. Apart from having a nasty accident, the only other options for the train behind to slow it will stop and wait for the one in front to get far enough ahead that there'll be enough time for the one behind to make an emergency stop if that day. Currently the capacity on the East Coast Main Line approaching Newcastle is only around 6 to 9 trains each way per hour. There's simply not enough room to have extra stations if you want to keep this intact. Basically illustrated here in a sort of string diagram is a theoretical journey showing two trains travelling between two stations. One's leaving on the hour and one at 15 minutes past. In this theoretical for the sake of simplicity we assume that it needs to be a clear 10 minutes spacing between the trains. This is way more than in reality but you get the idea. If we add an additional station, you'll see the first train stopping there for a 5 minute slot means the second no longer has the necessary 10 minutes headway in the second part of its journey. This second train would need to ensure its approach to the first station, whether it's stopping there or not, is 5 minutes slower, something which cascades all down its journey and beyond meaning that you have less space in the day to fit further services. Each additional station where a train stops means every train following it gets a further delay. And all this is before we consider that stopping at a station increases the chances of something unforeseen causing a delay of some kind. This is the way the things work when a line only has two tracks, which is the case on the East Coast Main Line. This keeps a lot of trains running well below their max speed. And there's a reason why you might experience your train suddenly stopping in a random place, such as on the approach to Central Station. If you're trying to mix different stopping patterns, it massively reduces the potential number of trains per hour on that stretch of track. We could add new tracks to the same line, I suppose. It's a bit tight due to all the development alongside the line, which, ironically, is the key reason why we're even considering doing this, but it's definitely possible in a lot of places. If you're smart with signals and timetables, then you didn't even need to add tracks to the entire route. With just a few passing loops you can make some substantial improvements which, honestly this isn't a terrible idea. But well, just a tick, there is a better option. Hello, what's this then? Can you see this little single track line connecting the East Coast Main Line to Tyne Valley Line? Do any trains use this? No, not really. Basically every train coming up from the direction of Dome heads straight into Newcastle. Even Teesside the Carlisle services stop in at Central Station first. All that this little bit of line currently does is dealing with rolling stock movements in the occasional freight train. Which is a bit of a surprise really, as if you zoom in and follow itself, you'll see it's actually pretty long, running alongside the East Coast Main Line all the way down to Bertley. It's double track in places too. Remember we are just saying the problem with the Main Line was it only has two tracks? Well here's another two tracks running right alongside it. Ah, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Sounds like we could really use this line. Cool eh? But wait! There's more! So if we zoom in a bit closer on the satellite view, well then we're gone full circle. This is Lobby Hill Road, this is back where I was standing at the start of the video. And here, there's the bridge I was looking at. And from this bird's eye view you can clearly see on top of it, we've got a disused railway path. Is it just me or is this not exactly what we need? With this little extra bit of track, that big long line going all the way down to Bertley, it isn't just for trains skipping Newcastle altogether. If we were to restore this wee little bit extra track, then trains could split off the main line down by Bertley and travel all the way up and onto the, underused remember, Tyne Valley Line as it approaches Newcastle Central. This old railway path, it's completely disused, there's no tracks on it, it hasn't been converted into a cycle lane, it's just sitting there, empty. 
The only time anyone sets foot here is the odd maintenance man cutting back the vegetation. So on the one hand we've got a big need for local traffic on the East Coast Main Line and Gateshead that we're kinda fill due to too much demand from express trains, and on the other hand we have a disused diversion line running right alongside it. The solution is clear, so much of it's already in place. In theory all we need to get this work is about 400 metres of new rails laid on a largely intact track bed. This is the Bencham Curve. This is the key to fixing the region's problems. It's a ready-built solution to our region's transport issues that runs right by major residential areas and employment zones. Get this done that could really boost the region's economy and strike a heavy blow against inequality. Not to mention the environmental and mental health gains eliminating much of the traffic trying to gain through Gateshead into the town. At this point in the video, I have a good quarter of an hour cut content where I get to excruciate and create some map detail about how I'd do this if I were emperor of all trains. But for the sake of piercing and chatting about things people might actually be interested in, let's quickly skip through all that and put the maps away. The first station I'd have then is Teams. Here it is on Victoria Road, just on the corner of the Convention Curve itself. Gan South, then you've got Saltwell Station, right next to a big patch of brownfield land absolutely ripe for development. After this then you've got the coordinates of the old Lowfell train station, it's ready to be reopened. It's not the most ideally placed for most of Lowfell, it's right at the bottom of the hill, but it isn't a decent place for a big chunk of Team Valley and a chunk of the town itself. After this we leave Gateshead's urban area, and this is where we'll get to what is probably the most important station of this entire project, one which I think we really should be building, even if absolutely no else I've talked about today gets done. The A1 motorway crosses our route here making this the absolutely perfect place for a station. Now parkway stations do get a lot of stick, much of it valid. Apart from the road all at this site seems to have gone for it as it helps tourists get to the Angel and North, well, sort of, if they don't mind hiking, and then there's all five people in Lamesley. But just think of all those people driving into Newcastle every day, how many of them will have a much easier time getting to this site just off the A1 and into town? Is this an ideal situation? Of course not, no one's going to pretend it is. They're still driving, those cars are still on the road, but they're not adding to the critical traffic problems around the centre of town. They're switching modes long before they get to the traffic scum around the bridges. To understand why a parkway station off the A1 is such a great idea, I'd encourage you to look at the metro and its parkway stations. Stations such as Northumberland Park get very respectable passenger numbers half a million a year plus. It's very typical for people living out in Northumberland to drive to these stations, park their car and then take the metro into the centre of Newcastle. As we've already covered, getting across the river into Newcastle is a huge problem. It's much worse than driving into Newcastle from the north. Come from the north you didn't have to worry about getting out of time. Despite this though, the folk from up in Northumberland have a whole bunch of parkway stations to use, whilst the larger number of people south of the time that didn't, they are forced to drive over the same few bridges, no other option. And as I say, it just so happens that near the Angel you have the absolutely perfect site for a parkway station. It's just past where the Sunderland Highway meets the A1. Not to mention anyone who might be driving up to Newcastle from further afield, probably done a parkway station could even grab people driving up the A1 to Newcastle from Mordor, um, I, mean, I mean the south. Angel Parkway man, just build it. Seriously, I've got a spare 20 quid here. Anyone else off for chipping in? That's the main event then. After this, well we could stop before on a tight budget, otherwise the next stations are pretty obvious. We've got no more free track to use, but there's plenty of space next to the main line to lay a new track and get us to a reopened Berkeley station. Beyond here the terrain gets rough, we'd have to track share, but it's a canny short trip into Chessie Street and we should be able to do this without causing too much trouble. At Chessie Street station itself, its western platform should be knocked down and shifted westward to give her a neat segregation of stopping services on the outside and no speeding past Chester through the middle. Again this is something that should be done, even if we do now else I've talked about here. Even by itself this change to Chessie Street station can improve local train service in the area dramatically. Chester's basically where I'd say a standard service should end. The terrain beyond there becomes even more rough and the prospect of adding new tracks to the main line a massive undertaking. Nonetheless, I'd hope we'd get some trains continuing on to Dome and maybe even Dalton stations. So that's how I'd do it, what would you do different? You might have noticed here that I completely skipped the major problem in this entire enterprise, getting out of time. Aye, with trains as well as with cars, getting out of time is where you really run into problems. You'll see for instance that though the Tyne Valley Line and the East Coast Main Lines are separate here, as we approach the King Edward VI Bridge it gets quite messy. The bridge does have four tracks, so fair enough. But once you get to the other end you run into issues with getting into the station. The smaller bay platforms used by the Tyne Valley Line are at the north, and the longer platforms for cross country expresses are at the south. This means that the throat of Central Station is really quite a mess, with trains having to cross each other's paths all the time. It's a really naff situation, quite an epic organisational and engineering challenge. It really needs to be solved to optimise our local railways. But that's option one for how we get out of the time. There are others. Option two is that we ignore the King Edward Bridge and instead loop around to enter Central Station from the east over the high level bridge. This is something that you find trains do on occasion. 
An advantage using the high-level bridge is that you avoid the London Bound main line altogether. Unfortunately on the east side of Central Station you also have problems with overcrowded access. On many occasions I've been on trains coming down from Edinburgh and I've got stuck here. All you're doing really is shifting the problem. Option 3? Well there is the Metro bridge in the middle. Since we are making Metro frequency trains and integration with the Metro network would be lovely, I guess we could tunnel down around here and join onto the Metro line. This option though is the least likely of the three I'd say. The excavations would cost a bomb and having a junction here would be very messy for Metro operations. Add if you ever can run above ground access option, and to put the focus on properly optimising the layout in Central Station instead, though it should make sure we keep properly integrated ticketing with the Metro despite the different platforms. It's worth remembering that the new Metros that are coming online from late this year or is it next year now, they're supposed to be capable of dual voltage operations, and of course there's nothing to say that we can't appear a normal mainline train in Metro colours. If I was Supreme Lord of the Rails I'd be running Metro services from the above ground Central Station as well as the underground one. Whilst we're off topic going in this direction, I'd also say that we should avoid leaving trains hanging around in Central for too long. Instead I'd look to take advantage of a missed opportunity in the soon to be launched Ashton and Newcastle route. I'd have trains from Ashton running right through Chester Street when Newcastle Central is just a hub in the middle rather than a terminal. This through run would have a lot of advantages in increasing frequency, as well as in helping to serve niche journeys. It's a good idea all around and again something which we're looking to do even if no one else has done. Back on topic then, let's wrap up. What's all this going to cost? Going with a per kilometre track cost of 4.5 million or so, based off the cost of the 191 million Northumberland line. By my count there's just short of 7 kilometres of new track today, that gives a total cost of 31 million in track. Adding on the stations, based on the cost of Horden station, I'm estimating a base cost of around 10 million apiece, with the Angel Parkway station going up to 30 million, based off the cost of a similar park and ride project being planned near Leeds. Early in Chessie Street I'm guesstimating at about 20 million apiece to account for working around the main line. It's all very arbitrary and lacking in detail I know, but each area will have its own local challenges to solve, and this video is already hour long without getting bogged down and all that. Bearing in mind we're doing fag packet numbers here and rounding up, I come to 150 million or so altogether. Sounds a lot I know, just think of the things you could do for yourself with that kind of silly money. But at the sort of scale the government spending works, 141 million honestly it's pennies, not even a blip on the national budget. Now yeah, despite my attempts to be ultra conservative with the numbers, in reality it would cost a fair bit more. But even if you double, triple, quadruple, round up to a billion, you're still talking about a really small sum for the impact this could bring. By reopening the Bencham Curve and extending local rail service down through the centre of Gateshead and into County Dome, you'd be bringing 40,000 more people within easy walking distance of a top quality transit station, with many more potential users via park and rides. Washington for example, it's famously one of the biggest towns in the country without a train station, it's home to 70,000 people, a large chunk of whom live on the west side of town. Stanley has 30,000, Horton 35, Hetton 15, lots of small towns where a very large chunk of the population need to get in Newcastle every day. Rebuilding the Bencham Curve would be a huge step forward for linking up the entire regional economy. This would bring enormous benefits, properly done right it could be a big job creator. These benefits would come not just for those actually using the trains, but for the entire region. Let's say though that you're really tight and or sceptical and reckon this will cost way too much. Well, even a budget mega stripped down version of I just proposed where we just build the curve in the Angel Station, it'll cost 50 million or so, it'd bring huge benefits to the local economy, the environment, and general opportunity and quality of life for over tens of thousands of people. Aye, and ah, the all very rough fag package calculations, a proper cost benefit analysis would need to be done before this scans anyway. Unfortunately people spend years nearing millions to do these, I just didn't have the resources. But comparing to projects that were given to go ahead locally and elsewhere, it does seem that it should match up very favourably. That's it for the delusions of a madman, with neither a single ounce of political power nor millions of pounds. Putting the cranes away then and getting back to reality? The actual experts then? Just what are they saying about the Bencham Curve? Where have their vast resources got them with this? Firstly, we've got Network Rail, the owners of most of the country's railways. They briefly mentioned potentially reopening the Benjamin Curve in an in-depth study from 2020, with a snappy title, <coughs> What is required to make the rail network beyond Church Fenton and Newcastle ready for the 2030s and beyond? <gasps> Sadly, Network Rail's views have very little in common with my proposal, though they are maybe the closest thing we have to an official line. Their plan for the Benjamin Curve is to use it solely as a bypass for the East Coast Main Line to handle freight and by extension increase capacity for express trains running to Newcastle. Which, yeah, yeah, it isn't a bad thing in itself. It is nice to see attention being paid to reopening the curve in whatever form, but this plan of theirs could potentially scupper any idea of improving local transport in the North East. It's the same story we've seen time and again around the world. Immediate surface level profits from connecting distant cities are prioritised over local transport which might not turn a profit in terms of ticket sales, but which does provide a massive boost to local economic performance. Network Real study does give us some interesting numbers, like that the curve could potentially give away 8 passenger services per hour in each direction, between York and Newcastle that is. 
This tells me that if we're terminating at Chester Street, keeping local and express traffic separate for all but the smallest sections of track, then a local train every 10 minutes or so, it doesn't sound too infeasible at all. Similarly, the prospect of reopening the Bencham Curve and building a third track on the East Coast Main Line north of Chester was also discussed by the Joint Transport Committee for the North East in December 21. There's some promising notes in here. It is recognition from local government of the need for these improvements, but they fail to say this is a critical priority that it is. Particularly disheartening is that a lot of their focus seems to be on squeezing out some extra services to London rather than local connectivity. Whilst we're on the subject of a heavy rail focus, there's also Real Future, they're an established campaign group who have a Team Valley station on their list of campaigns. A lot of what they say lines up what I've been discussing in this video, right down in their analysis of what other people have to say about the Belgian curve. Meh. Nah. The Team Valley station that they propose is on the site of the old Lowell Fell station, which, as I mentioned in my ideal world scenario, is quite nicely placed for real access to the Team Valley industrial estate. I'm certainly not opposed to reopening this station, but as I mentioned, I didn't think this is the number one priority station to be built. Far more important would be a parkway off the A1. Maybe I'm too much of a cynic, but I can't help but think here that the prioritising rule of cool lets turn back the clock and undo beaching over our practical needs for the future. Moving on then. Back in 2020, the government asked for applications for something called the Restoring Your Railways Ideas Fund. Three local MPs, led by Gateshead Zane Mearns, took part in this back when we opened in the Benchman Curve. Mearns said, and I quote, <coughs> This is a very realistic scheme. We've got a stretch of line connecting Gateshead, Tyneside and the Team Valley, and it won't disrupt rail traffic on the main line either. Plus, it's a flexible idea, because it could be utilised for a metro extension or for future rail services. Mearns also added that this project would be great for helping to get people to work in the Team Valley and the whole general idea of decarbonising the economy, which, you know, it all sounds rather great. It's very in line with my thinking. Thumbs up, Mr Mearns. Alas... The Restoring Your Railways Fund it was not a serious attempt to improve the railways in the UK, and rather just pork barrel politics. The amount of funding on offer, to be shared nationwide, was only £500 million max, and I somehow can I say the government given a quarter of a nationwide fund to the North East. The Bencham Curve was amongst many other good ideas in non-Tory constituencies, predestined to be rejected. I've investigated, but I've not found out on how a decision of which projects to take forward was made. It's, you know, it's all very shifty. Sigh. So, what else has been said then? Well, over its history we've seen various loosely mapped out possible network extensions from Nexus, the Tyne and Weir Transport Authority, some of which seem to include the curve and some not. It seems to be basically visible on a Metro Futures map from 2020 for instance. In some other plans though, it's notable by its absence. The old Project Obvious plans for instance. The most up-to-date official word of Nexus is the North East Transport Plan from 2021. This document clearly spells out the reintroduction of the Bencham Curve and connections to Team Valley and Chester Street. Also wonderful to see here, the Team Valley and A1 Park and Ride stations are clearly labelled. On the other hand, a little less encouraging and from exactly the same official body in the same year, is a completely different map as part of their North East Rail and Metro strategy. To even get this wrong, it is nice to see some actual plans here, it would be great to see this happen, but it's clear as day in this version of things that the Bencham Curve is not included in their vision of the future. Rather, they've got the plan to take trains from Chester Street into Newcastle via the Metro Centre and into what I assume is St James's Metro Station. Which, I mean, aye, it is a way to solve our crossing the river problem. And a Metro extension in the West End, where well, it's the Holy Grail, even just a little bit would be a good thing. But just think of quite how much extra time this will be adding on to journeys from Gateshead and Chester into the town. Even though a stick to the East Coast Main Line, there'll be a lot of people for whom the bus are driving would still be the more convenient option. If we're sending them all away to the metro centre before they get into town, then I really kind of think there'll be many people for whom taking the train will be the best option. These maps, of course, are purely indicative. They shouldn't be taken too literally. But it is a bit worrying that the same organisation seems to have two separate plans with no agreement on what's the optimum to shoot for. Those are the key, most relevant bits of documentation I've been able to uncover about the Benjamin Curve and its reopening. The next pieces are largely of historic curiosity only. My completionist instinct tells us to include them, though they likely won't have much relevance to the current day. You see a lot of mentions of Metro Extension down Gateshead and various books on the topic. I've got one book published back in the early 80s, for example, which speaks of the Metro as some fangled future contraption, with a future extension to Lamesley prominently mentioned. Colin Alexander's more recent book in the Tiny Way Metro also mentions this a bit. Also from the, ah, uh, what might have been, files. I've come across a 2014 study by Nexus which proposes a near one park and ride station using the Bencham Curve. And... Ah, it all sounds lovely, doesn't it? But unfortunately it didn't happen. It definitely needs revisiting though. From a similar time period, you've also got the Metro Futures report, which mentions similar stuff about an near one park and ride station. 
Here, however, the suggestion carrying it forward towards Berkeley and Chessie Street with new tracks added alongside the main line. Interestingly, they also talk of a new station between the two. Such a North Chessie Street station is something I considered putting on my quick sketch, but you know, to me, it seemed like overreaching and asking too much before we even got the Bay of Basics done. Nonetheless, great to see some official recognition that it would be a good idea. There's also many plans from the recent past that would have been great and changed so much if they'd happened, but they didn't. So let's keep looking towards the future and try to make it better next time. Part 6, Conclusion. Was I meant to read that part? Yeah, I was. Um, so that's about it then. That's all I have to see on the Benjamin Curve. I probably went way off topic quite a lot. But I hope my key point gets through that this is a very serious, realistic idea that would bring huge benefits for the region. It's been proposed a few times in the past, but unfortunately up to now it's failed to gain any traction. With the current political climate though, and the climate climate, I'm hopeful that in the future we will see local rail service down through Gateshead. It just needs to be done. I won't claim that the Bencham Curve will magically solve all our problems overnight, but there's no other use of government money that would have such an effective impact in improving the lives of people in the region. Properly done, this project could make up a key part of a holistic whole that will eliminate car dependency for the majority of people in the region and drastically improve our economy and our quality of life. The Bencham Curve's just sitting right there. Put it to some use, man. You might not believe it to look at it, but this video's been our three years in the making. Various things have popped up for us like kids, work, illness and my general incompetence to make getting it out very slow going. Since I started making this video, there's been further developments which really enhances the need to getting this project done. The government has finally decided to get a move on with the long overdue repairs to the Time Bridge. Due to the delay in performing these works, they stand to be far more extensive and disruptive than if they'd been done on time 10 years ago. Over much of 2024 and maybe beyond, the Time Bridge is going to have reduced capacity. And remember, even when fully open and working perfectly fine, the Time Bridge is already an overburdened traffic bottleneck. Chaos looms. If this Bencham Curve thing makes so much sense, then why has it not been done already then? Well, from the moment I decided to start this channel blabbing on about local issues, I tell myself, do not make it too political. I probably failed in that already in my first video, but it really shouldn't take a genius to put two and two together on that front. Even at the best of times, the North East really gets funding for its infrastructure, and these are absolutely not the best of times. We we'll have to keep pressing for this. When you're in a hole, you different keep digging. The ideology of austerity clearly isn't working. We need to invest and open up new opportunities for the economy. The Northumberland line reopened at Ashton. It's a great example of us actually getting some spending on low-hanging fruit for once. This line reopening, really, it's great. I'm totally behind it. A very sensible use of money. But the potential cost benefits of reopening the bedroom curve could simply blow this out of the water. It did wonders for even the fundamental outlook of so many people in some of our most deprived communities. I hope that you're convinced. I especially hope that you're a politically powerful figure and you can get the gears in motion. Even if not though, then aye, thanks for watching, especially this far, seriously. This video's been literally our two years in the making, not that you'd know it by watching it. It's been a hefty learning endeavour over the years, figuring out so many new things and fighting against perfectionist tendencies of mine. Since I started making this video, I've switched job twice, had a kid or two, built and moved into a new office, dealt with a health issue, uh, which affected my speech, you know, all sorts. Really hasn't been the optimal time in my life to take on a new hobby like making videos for the YouTubes. But boo hoo, woe is me, etc etc, you get the point. So aye, thanks for your time. Please check out my other videos when I get a chance to make them. At my current rate, the next one should be in the late 2020s. Though I do recognise in hindsight that I very definitely made a mistake in kicking things off with such an important epic as this one. And next on my list are a few considerably smaller pieces dealing with transport and urbanism and maybe some cultural and historic bits and bobs in the great land of Venetia. To half an hour. Stay canny? Is that too much? Probably too much, isn't it? Aye. So.